Hey everyone, and welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and this is episode number 125. And it's a special one, because I have two guests on today. And it is David Wasserman and Samuel Zenyimer, and they are from Alta Planning and Design. And we're gonna be talking some data and some you know creative applications of data in terms of engaging uh, the communication in the, at the community level to be able to move active transportation projects forward. And as you might recall, if you watched the last episode with Lior uh, Steinberg, episode number 20, 124, we talked a little bit about that as well. So this is the next evolution, the next step in that conversation. And it's, it's truly, truly fascinating. And so let's get right to it with David and Samuel. I am absolutely delighted to have uh, David Wasserman and Samuel Zneimer here from Alta Planning and Design. And David, you're uh, based out of the Seattle office, and uh, Samuel, you're in LA, my original whole Congrats. hometown. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for having us. So, um, what I'll have you do is just give a real quick um, overview and introduction uh, to yourself. Just literally like a 30-second uh, overview, um, uh, you know, and really how you got interested in doing work in this field. So, David, we'll start with you. That's a, it's a big question, but um, I think, uh, yeah, my name is David Wasserman. Uh, I'm the data science practice leader at Alta Planning and Design. And in terms of the work that I do, what I spend a lot of my time doing is thinking about how we use data and metrics uh, to help communities meet multifaceted goals. And for me, that means looking at all the things that they're interested in accomplishing through different types of uh, active transportation plans or mobility plans to kind of understand how we map a pathway and potential ways um, to meet um, the needs that their communities are, are trying, to, um, trying to address. Uh, I got interested in a lot of this, I think, from my interest in uh, GIS and spatial analytics. Um, and a lot of my work actually um, has been around how we articulate scenarios, look at uncertainty, and, and really try and illustrate um, how we make more sustainable communities. And I think a lot of my interest has been based around kind of that, how do we make more sustainable resilient communities, how do we adapt, and how do we use data to inform those discussions? Fantastic. Samuel. Thanks. Uh, Sam Zanimer with Alta Plane Design out of the LA office. Uh, I've been working on transportation since I got out of college. Uh, active transportation focus started while I was working at the city of South Pasadena where I got my first job, and I was writing the bicycle master plan. Uh, it wasn't what I was hired to do. But as soon as I started that work, I really enjoyed it. And then I saw how much impact it had on everyday lives. I think one thing about active transportation versus almost all other transportation is that it affects everybody. There is no way to get around it. You're always going to you're going to be a pedestrian at some point in your trip. I hopefully at some point in time we can give you enough facilities to be a bicyclist on our roadways. But no matter what, active transportation is a critical part of everyday life and making it easier to get around to your community and better understand and enjoy your community. So that's how I got into it. I grew up in South Pass, so I wanted to make my community better. And I thought active transportation was definitely one of the big missing pieces and one that could really help everybody, regardless of age, ability, or income. It's really a unifying feature of transportation, is active transportation. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Well, and I'm very familiar with your area. I'm originally from Southern California and uh, uh, did my undergraduate at USC. Uh, of course, uh, you did your graduate work there, so yeah, fight on. <laughs> um, so what I'd like to do is, is, is really try to dive into the type of work that you all do 
and and bring this up from a visualize you know visualize this from from uh, the perspective of 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 what that work manifests in you, David you had mentioned you know GIS stuff and I reached out to the both of you when uh, you know after a, a couple of articles were were uh, presented and yeah. and put out there and I'm like ooh this is cool because it's very visual and interesting and mm-hmm. and it'd be something that would pop for the uh, the podcast here um, where where should we start where, where you, you sent a ton of stuff over, so it, it, it'd be nice to kind of jump off and, and give the audience a little bit of a, a visual as to, to uh, the type of work that you guys do. Well, why, well, why don't we start with kind of what caught your attention the first time, and maybe we can talk about uh, how we're using origin destination data okay. uh, to help uh, plan more active communities. So this is the travel demand model flow. What are we looking at here? Yeah, here. Yeah. So what we're looking at right now is essentially what we've done is we've taken the entire um, MTC travel demand model outputs for like the year 2020. And for those unfamiliar, travel demand models are a tool used by transportation planning professionals to try and understand how uh, the distribution of land uses, infrastructure uh, can be more or less simulated um, to understand the distributions of different people's trips throughout the day. And it's based off of travel surveys, asking people how they um, spend their time, um, where they travel, what they're traveling for, and how they travel. Um, And we're looking at the outputs of MTC's model, which is the MPO in the Bay Area. And what we're trying to illustrate for this is we've taken every county And we've looked at where are their relatively short um, SOV, HOV trips. Um, So looking at short vehicle trips, but also where are the distributions of model bicycle and walking trips across um, the entire nine county Bay Area. And so what you can do in this one is you can change counties, you can turn off bike or walk and turn on the short HOV trips and kind of see the distributions of those model trips. And this can be very helpful for understanding kind of the desire lines of people, where they might want to go, where the model thinks people are currently walking and biking. Traditionally, these models are not very sensitive to walking and biking behavior, um, but they are very well attuned to vehicle trip behavior. And so when we look at vehicle trips for our purpose of planning active communities, Um, For example, Samuel and I worked together on a project in Southern Orange County, which is one of the other um, visualizations you have pulled up, where we were looking at short trips to identify mode shift potential. Right. Fantastic. Go ahead, Samuel. Yeah. And what I love about the Alta Flow mapping tool is if you do get to click into it a little bit, it really helps define how strong connections are to each other. So the banded lines that you see, the wider they are, the bigger the connection or the more trips that are taken through those connections. And that's a really powerful tool while you're doing outreach or trying to communicate that data to decision makers. It's really easy to say like, oh, this many people go here, this many people go there. But it's really hard to envision that. And more importantly, it's really hard to envision those interactions to see where it happens more and where it's all pulling from. Right. And when you get this type of mapping and this types of numbers that really help detail down to collector spots and nodes and creating those connections in a really easy visualization tool, it really helps us communicate that to the public. It really helps build support for specific connections because you can see that they'll have huge benefits. And it really helps refine your decision-making process on prioritization, on investment, because you want to go where there are more trips. Right, like the right. big game that we really want to play here is to make trips more available, short trips to active transportation. Uh, we're not going to be converting a lot of trips that are over five miles to be a walking or biking trip. But when you see a, a location like you can see in San Jose, that there are a magnitude of short trips, you know that those connections and those desire lines exist. It really gives you fortification when you're trying to make your decision about prioritizing which connections first to really give you the most ROI, the most bang for your buck, 
and really making your investment count. So we have really limited dollars in active transportation and giving the public and decision makers more tools like the AltaFlow map really help us go through that process and that conversation about how to highlight a project and its importance because there's so many of them out there and making sure we can find the right ones that really help tipping points change how people actually function in transportation is what this AltaFlow map really gives us and lends to is that if we can change those trips in that corridor of less than a mile to a walking trip, you've changed thousands of trips. Yeah. And that's yeah. the goal. Yeah. And really trying to find those rich areas of investment really help our investments matter. And that's really what we really want to do. And honestly, if we can show that these investments matter and you build momentum, highlighting the places that you can get the most return on investment, it makes the next project easier. Right. Yeah. So each successful project only builds to another. And so using a, a, a tool like AltaFlow not only shows you where the first benefit will be, but where the second, the third, and the fourth. And knowing those connections is really a helpful tool as we're trying to create prioritization, like these huge prioritization rankings for all these areas that have thousands of projects. And these tools help that. And without them, you're almost left to a box of like, hey, you just have to trust me. But this visualization tool is live, it's active, you can click on things. And so it doesn't feel like we're holding all the things in a black box anymore. It's really democratizing data out there. And it really allows our clients and the communities to see what we're seeing to help them make engage their own decisions. It. Right, yeah. engage exactly. with it. Exactly, yeah. engage with it. And that's what we want the most of. I mean, public engagement is one of the hardest things to get in our planning work, regardless of a highway project or a road project or a, or a sidewalk. But these tools make it more engaging and make it easier for the public to get to an understanding of the corridor and the data that usually would take somebody with David's understanding of data to understand. Now it allows me to be able to see it and understand it. And then hopefully that allows the community members to do the same. And so I think that's one of the greatest, greatest elements of these tools is that we've gone from black box data to open data and being able to visually see it in a way that I don't think we've been able to before. Yeah, yeah. go ahead, David. Like, can, I mean, conventionally, you're kind of stuck with static maps where you try to right. show a bunch of lines with different thicknesses and you, you kind of have to craft the story. But in this one, you can zoom in the different areas. You can turn off those um, buttons for, walk, for bike and walk and show SOV, HOV. You can show different modes. And what we found useful about this is it works for different type of data too. For example, if you go to the Toronto example, um, that one is looking at, um, we're, we're working on a bike share expansion plan actually in, uh, in uh, Toronto, Canada. And, and of course it's, um, it's loading. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's a big, it's a lot of data. Uh, there are a lot of bike share trips in Toronto. Yeah, um, yeah. But, but one of the things that we're able to do is kind of look at not only like different types of, um, you know, different trip distances, different, different distribution of trips across the region, but we can also look at 2021 versus 2019 data and take a look at things like how did pandemic behave, how did the, sorry, how did the pandemic or, uh, influence, um, changes in people's use of the system and investigate those differences. And so we're seeing more and more sources of this origin destination data um, that's relevant to active transportation is, I guess, my main point, uh, whether it's the leveraging of big data sources like mobile trace um, types of information from vendors like streetlight data uh, or emerging data sets like connected vehicle data. Um, even though a lot of it tends to be somewhat focused on automobile trips, if we look through the lens of what is a feasible thing that we can convert? What are the distributions and alignment of those trips? Do we have facilities that we can show that um, match where people are trying to go to and from? We, we can kind of help um, inform our planning. Yeah. And what's interesting too, and I just turned on the casual member uh, button. So you, you, for the viewers, you probably saw the, the lines get thicker because obviously if you turn on the casual members versus just the annual members for the Toronto bike share, uh, you're going to get a, a, a much uh, bigger number in terms of uh, folks who are, are using it and potentially a different 
type of trip too, in terms of their destinations. Um, although because it's a dock based system, uh, the the destinations will ultimately you know go to another dock versus dock. A, a completely dockless type of system. Uh, the other thing, obviously, that's influencing the um, the, the destinations will frequently be whether there are, um, uh, you know, appropriate facilities to be able to Correct. get there because, you know, quite honestly, they, you know, if they know there's absolutely no uh, safe and inviting facilities out to a particular destination, they, they may not choose, you know, that particular mobility uh, mode at that time. So, yeah, go ahead. And, and, I, and I, I just want to draw attention to that. Yeah. This, this tool only really helps us understand kind of this aspect of demand. Right. And demand exactly. is a, a very narrow lens. It's a very popular lens to talk yeah. about active transportation, but there's a lot more to talk about, whether it's connectivity, right. looking at equity, safety, right. um, and other types of benefits, green infrastructure coordination. The, those are the types of things also that I think really matter. As well, this just yeah. gives us one tool to look at, kind of one aspect um, of of, of uh, active transportation. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's always important to to always keep in the back of our minds when we, we're looking at the demand uh, side of this yeah. is that. Yeah, you don't build a bridge over a river based on the number of people who are swimming across the river. So it. Um. it Yes, exactly. <laughs> we there, and that is part of the build it and they will come aspect of it is, and it, it is not ever that simple as build it and they will come. It's build it and they will come and engage it and follow it up and you know et cetera and make sure that it is the right it in terms of uh, appropriate facilities. So you, you mentioned South Orange County as well. So I'm going to pull pull this one up. Um, I spent. A lot of time in South Orange County, mostly surfing. But, you know, when I was living in North Orange County and started my career, uh, I would head down there, you know, frequently and, and hang out and do some stuff down uh, as far south as San Clemente and in that particular area. Now, this is an area that is notorious for being very, very car centric. Um, it looks like we've got, you know, Ir Irvine here and Laguna uh, Laguna Beach and some Laguna Niguel stuff. Um, and this is fun. It's moving. <laughs> What's going on? Yeah, here? It, it, it has the option of changing the animation style, um, okay. which, which can be very fun. Um, but, uh, if there's nothing really different in the data, but okay. I think Sam, Sam's in a better space to talk about the project. So Sam, do you want yeah, to say anything about and I, I I lended to this map because I liked it moving and yeah. had made sure David went with this style specifically for the visualization element yeah. of it and really highlighting the connections. And and as you explained, the land use in South Orange County really lends itself to be more vehicle centric, auto centric with fewer places to have those active transportation connections, both for topography alone, but also just how they were developing as a community. And we saw that there are some real, but there are still real connections there. And there are still locations where you can build really strong bikeways that would help support the active transportation that's going on. I mean, this area, while it might not have the traditional hallmarks of an LA or San Francisco with a big grid and like being able to make direct, more direct connections. What it does have is a college and those connections really do matter and understanding where you get some benefits. And we can really see it here is that there are great benefits right around the college. If you're looking at investment and short trips, this mapping tool really helps you when you're thinking about where should we plan these trips out. Where should we invest in our facilities? There are places, unfortunately, that won't see huge benefits from having even a class one path. There's just not enough people and it might not lend itself to what we want to consider ourselves, but our active trips that really have, like I would think utilitarian is really what we're highlighting here. And that's one other thing that I think we need to like be very cognizant of in the active transportation world is what are we designing for? What type of trip and what type of connection we're trying to make? 
So in South Orange County, there are really important connections that are made through class one connections, but those lend themselves to be slightly more recreational because of the land uses around them and the destinations that people are going to. But you're looking at a place like Irvine, Costa Mesa, Santa Ana, Tustin, that kind of triangle lends itself to a lot of utilitarian trips. There's job generators, there's destinations that people really want to go to, and there are trip potential that are really high. So it, it gives us the tools to really see where we should be investing. And for the South Orange County plan, we're looking at active transportation in the lens of all transportation. So this is one element of that project, but it really helps with our planning portion of it at Alta and helping inform the project that if you want to get more trips to be active transportation trips, reducing congestion, BMT, and other metrics project goals, you have to invest in these locations that show demand is there and that you can actually make these trips by active transportation. So again, data can show us a lot of things. You do want to layer that with an understanding, a core understanding of the communities that you're working in to give you better context that makes this data meaningful. But these tools really help you as one of the layers, the layers of data analysis. So as David talked about, you can only use these data points to ensure that you can understand one part of this, and this is demand. Especially when we're thinking about uh, like a long-term planning uh, horizon, which this project is looking at, that like you can really think about the long-term consequences of active transportation and looking at those generators and destination points as like almost guiding lines to where you want to invest. Because of the long-term nature of this type of planning effort, I think demand matters more than it typically would because likely these land use centers that are getting these trips aren't changing over that time when a lot of things can change. It's hard to project out 40 years or 25 years of development, but that college isn't leaving, that airport isn't going anywhere, and Irvine is still going to be that core. And you know these things, and that's where you want to make sure whatever data you're using, you're using it in context of how to properly contextualize it to help tell your story. So you, well, you, you just brought up a, a good point there, the data you're using. Um, where is this data coming from? This, this particular data, and this is one of the things I was going to mention, was this particular data set is, again, from a travel model um, that they were already using on the project. And there are always other sources for active travel data. But if you use um, a data set that people are familiar with and try and find a new way to use it, um, you can help build on the work of others and tell a story that, that, that still um, can be impactful. And I guess one of the things that we've talked about is how, how this helps us with utilitarian trips. Um, models are heavily designed around understanding utilitarian trips. Um, there's some changes in industry with uh, new tools like activity-based models, which can give you a little more detail. Um, we, we use um, a few example, like we, we use a platform called Replica, which is kind of based on an activity-based model uh, in different areas that typically don't have access to this type of data in multiple locations around the country. Um, and that can give you, like you look at weekend activities, for example, to get a sense of the distribution of recreational trips. But I think, again, just bringing it back, we're talking a lot about demand, but there's also the larger discussion of barriers. How do we look at barriers? How do we uh, talk about barriers? And you have um, a few links and maps that we shared um, that we can talk through as well to kind of get through how we talk about that. Um, you have one link right there where we, our recent blog post on uh, digital twins um, for sustainable transport. It, we could talk about that um, as one example of this where we kind of outlined a few communities in this post um, where we're, we're increasingly looking at AI derived data from um, basically aerial imagery. Um, and we work with our partner uh, Copia, uh, Copia AI, and what they do is they're able to look at aerial imagery and run it through a combination of algorithms and their own um, QA, QC process, and out comes geocoded sidewalks with their width attributes, um, crosswalk locations, and they can even do deeper 
uh, right-of-way scan. So what we're looking at in this map, for example, when it comes to barriers, is for a safe route to school plan where we really get to dig into the details and look at how we connect specific destinations uh, to a wider community. Um, we're looking at the distance between marked crosswalks across the entire city, um, which is conventionally something very difficult to do. Right. Fascinating. Um, yeah. And, you know, and David's talking about barriers and essentially the next step. And I think what data is really helping us do is really understanding the context of different communities. It is really hard. In the past, it was almost impossible to get this data unless you're a large, uh, what's it, municipality that has this data already readily available. In the past, we'd be working in essentially a vacuum of data. Uh, getting this type of sidewalk data, crosswalk data, was impossible for most places. We're talking about something that's so labor intensive that it's infeasible and honestly almost impractical. I'm working on a countywide plan right now. Trying to pull that data together would be impossible. Even at something as a scale of like Modesto, it would be impossible without having this AI derived data that's giving us a new opportunity to really visualize uh, what's it infrastructure in a way that before we would have just either we would have had to have somebody out there and walking each one of these corridors every step of it or just kind of relying on not really reliable data to hopefully get us there but now we have these tools like and david's talking about mark crosswalk specifically in this one and why that's so important for access and barriers is that is that anything can be a barrier we, we've talked about this internally a lot of times. How do we make things more accessible? And it's by removing barriers. But we also realize so many things can be barriers. Everybody thinks about a fence or a freeway as the main barriers. But anything that's an arterial road could be a barrier. A two-lane road that's high speed with no marked crosswalks is a barrier to a lot of communities, especially when you're thinking about safe routes. Would you want to let a child run across a two-lane road with no crosswalks? Generally, no. So, I mean, we don't really want children running across streets to begin with, but we want to make sure that there's enough connections across any roadway. Frequency matters in making sure that it's safe design and it's an accessible uh, location. So if you had a, just a two-lane highway but no crossing points, it's inaccessible now. It's an island and, upon itself. And, and this, David, and this yeah. can impact... This can impact safety too. Like one of the things, one of the interesting findings that we found is um, when you look at mid-block collisions, for example, um, we found that they tended to be more concentrated across the city of Modesto um, on areas with much larger crosswalk spacing. And it's not that surprising that you see people's like wh where where are people going to cross in placing places where it isn't marked? It's places where it's inconvenient to cross. I mean, this isn't it's not rocket science. Um, but having that localized evidence and being able to talk through those things in a way that it's entirely relevant to their community, not saying like there's this big city that did this study. Um, they show that, you know, you should, if you have crosswalk spacing like this, you'll see these benefits. And sometimes we often run into, we're not that city. We're not San Francisco. We're not, we're not New York. Um, and, and a lot of the data that we have sometimes in those high capacity, high data rich communities, um, is, is hard to transfer, but this gives us more and more options in how we tell stories about sidewalk availability. There's another map, um, of sidewalk availability that we developed. Um, but, uh, th those are the types of things that I think can really help illustrate that. And what's really neat is when we start incorporating it into um, our connectivity metrics and our connectivity analysis right. as well. Yeah. Yeah. And just kind of like as a planner who hears that and gets that data and gets this type of map, and what it really helps me also do is think about where we're going to make our recommendations. It's really easy to just throw a map together of recommendations. But if you have data, especially local context data, it makes a huge difference in understanding how our recommendations will influence uh, activity at either crossing, improve safety, improve connectivity, as David's alluding to. Yeah. 
Yeah. But really to tell us a story and to be able to tell your own community a story about your street. Uh, so much of our literature, as David alluded to, is either generated at the highest level at the federal and state levels or at big cities or at places that so happen to have the money or funded to do that one study. But every city I deal with always says, well, I am, we're not them. And they're right. Every city is different. Every context can be different. I mean, I, we work in, Alta works in every context. We work in like Mount Shasta down to Atlanta to South Orange County. So we're talking about spectrums of income, access, equality, that span all types of things. So they are right. Like cities are, they know themselves and they know that they aren't this other city. We have found that literature does kind of prevail over all those things. Safety is safety. Right. And we have a lot of things and a lot of tools and a lot of studies that show us that these things are safe. But it is always hard to make that argument per city. But having this data that David can really show that because we don't have marked crosswalks, people are crossing here at this mid block and they're getting hit is a much more important story to tell than saying the data, the overall literature tells me that only 250 right. feet is like the minimum crossing distance between or minimum distance between mark crosswalks to be safe. That doesn't really resonate with community members. It doesn't resonate with decision makers and city council members. But what does is you pull up that individual street in Modesto and show that issue that gets them to respond, that gets your community members to buy in, and that's how you create better planning outcomes and better planning decisions. So it's like data can tell us so many things, but in reality, what it's really doing for me as the planner is giving me the tools to be able to tell the story and make the right recommendations and give, again, people context to those decisions to show why we did them. So many times it's always a question of why, and having data to tell us why is really a tool that we might not have had before, and now we have at our disposal, and we have it that can be done really well and, and just visually appealing, which is a huge difference when we're talking about large plans and public outreach that is fighting for attention in a space where planning is not sexy. It's right. not like the first thing. It's, it's sexy for us. We love right. it. I love maps. I love data. But it isn't what's going to sell somebody on a Sunday night or on a Wednesday night to come to a meeting. But if they can see collision data and they understand that this corridor and this community is dangerous and we can show why and show how we can make it better, that gets people to a meeting. That gets people thinking about a problem rationally and helping us make that quality decision for their community. So I love the fact of working with data analytics and working with David He's giving me more tools to help me connect to the community and make better planning decisions. And that's what we really love out of this data. These are really core function data, as I call it. Understanding your sidewalks, your crosswalks, and bike lanes is probably some of the least sexy data, but is so fundamental in understanding cities and communities. And now we have ways to visualize it that is more appealing. And David can talk a little bit more about how they go about this process and how we can internalize that data and create mapping sets. And as this one shows, like a visual understanding to illustrate bigger topics that would normally take a thousand words that a picture could solve once. So it's, this is where David is able to bring the projects that is really special is not only getting data, these huge fields of data into a meaningful map, but that map can tell the story without me having to constantly talk about it. And that's and, one of the big tools, the data visualization. And, and I, think, I think when we think about like this inventory data, this contextual data that we're alluding to, it's, it's often underappreciated. Um, a lot of people, for example, there's a lot of discussion about the use of big data in transportation planning, new emerging data sets. And again, we're talking about demand and, it's, and it might be how we might start a conversation to kind of say, you know, there are, there, there's so much potential in this community, but being able to really talk about what is traditionally mundane, this, this context, whether it's land use information, how the right of way is laid out, it, that is very, very actionable information because it's how you identify gaps and it's how, it's how you identify what's missing. 
and, and what are the causes of concern. Um, and so a lot of the time, all of our efforts are about how do we, how do we bring context to the problem? How do we tell, how do we come up with ways to transform data into meaning and, and then transform that meaning into recommendation and action? Um, and, and I think that's, that those are kind of the, the key things that we're looking at, like, and, and what's really important to appreciate is the scalability of these, some of these technologies. If you are a, an advocacy or a planner, um, I highly suggest platforms like Mapillary. Um, they, they are now free to use, um, as a result of recent acquisitions. Um, but like you can take a, your smartphone and attach it to your bike bike around your community and this platform will extract every street sign, speed limit information, which believe it or not is incredibly helpful. Um, if you're trying to plan in a community, it's very hard to get at, uh, up to date and comprehensive speed limit information. And if, if you are working in those spaces, this is something that you can do that, that actually is a resource that like firms like Alto will check. Um, to see if, if there's something that we're missing or if the speed limit data is um, based on something real, where are the stop signs, where are the signal lies, intersections. Um, and trying to bring it all together is what we're really trying to bring to our network planning. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm glad you, you, you pointed out that this is uh, on the Mapillary uh, platform, and I'm sure that uh, many people in the audience uh, would be interested in in understanding more about that, the fact that there's a low barrier to entry of it being free, oh, yeah. to be able to you know try to help understand uh, the the current conditions out there, the inventory. Uh, you can see the the stop signs, the speed limits, the crossings, uh, all of that is is sort of highlighted here. And and again, especially for some some of those cities, and Samuel, you mentioned it, is you know, especially some of those smaller communities and and uh, sub, maybe in a suburban context, uh, they aren't any of the the big big cities. Uh, there may not be a lot of initiative uh, formally happening within the the city structure. And so uh, oftentimes it's it's advocates that are, you know, <laughs> bootstrapping things yeah. and trying to, you know, educate the and push upwards towards the uh, uh, towards the politicians and, and as well as the city staff. So be, having the ability to visually present something like this that gives that inventory and, 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 and to your point, David, you know, identifying some of the gaps that might be out there, su super important and empowering. Yeah. And, and I, I think, I think data is like one of those first steps. Um, I, you know, you can't, you can't manage what you don't measure. Right. Yeah, um, exactly. And, and, and a lot of times the investment that goes into maintaining our understanding of our own communities, um, from a sustainable transportation perspective right. is, is hit or miss. Yeah. Um, you know, you have some good, um, examples of uh, how it can work in practice with transit. You know, I think there's more and more work with open data standards, for example, um, around GTFS and sort of general transit feed specification um, the, uh, and, and those similar types of data standards where we can create insights about transit pretty quickly or even generate scenarios. But I, I think working and getting some type of baseline data for active transportation beyond bike lanes is something we're starting to see be something we can expect. You know, there are MPOs increasingly leveraging Acopia data, for example, to give all of their communities a baseline sidewalk and crosswalk inventory. Right. And that's huge. Um, SEMCOG, um, for example, has an online map of every single crosswalk and sidewalk that they extracted. Um, and, um, that that's in the Michigan area for, for those, um, not familiar, but, um, generally, um, these, these are very powerful tools that give us something to start from. Yeah. I'm going to pull up the, uh, the Nashville, um, uh, piece here sure. with the, 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 the vision zero stuff. What's going on with this, this little, uh, gif in this loop. So one of the things that we're increasingly looking at um, is how do we present um, data in a 
digital in a digital format that's very accessible um, and enable people to explore the analysis that was done as part of major projects. Um, as part of our Nashville Vision Zero plan, mm -hmm. uh, we did a lot of um, work uh, with the city of Nashville uh, and other stakeholders to say, how do we give you a data dashboard that you can maintain and leverage into the future um, where we can bring together all the work that we did to focus on um, the connection between safety and equity, uh, what were some of the top crash types that we discovered, all of that um, in an interactive way for people to explore. And it's kind of part of this trend where increasingly what we what we see a lot of the progress that's happened, especially during the pandemic with regard to like digital transformation, is this peak into a world where we're able to create living plans. Um, where if we're able to keep these types of digital resources updated, add more content to them, um, it, it can be one tool among many where kind of data serves as this backbone way of moving plans into the future, um, providing a mechanism to update them and a way to hold ourselves accountable as professionals on whether or not we're making progress on important goals like safety. Um, so this is just one example of, of that type of a trend. Yeah. Samuel, go ahead. Yeah. And as a planner, so many times I, in the past, I've had a, I create a plan, it gets adopted and it sits on a shelf. Right. And there wasn't a really great mechanism to keep logging all of the changes that have happened since the plan started. And there's some municipalities that are acting on the plans right away. Like uh, the community of San Luis Obispo, they had the plan for like a week and they already started implementing projects from it. Right. And, but whether you do or don't, what the hardest part I think in the past has been is how do we measure those effects? How do we track those projects? How do we track change? So it's like, I created a sidewalk and a curb extension here. What does that do to all the other projects in my queue list? What does it do to, the fact is that we might have skipped a project because it was part of a huge corridor project. Now we knocked off like five of those projects, but they're all different parts of our, these huge prioritization lists we create after each one of these projects. It's having data and being able to track it through these living dashboards, internal tools that we're hoping to give cities now to really help change that static plan into a living document that they can con continue to track for five to 10 or years beyond that until they actually go back to a full update. So it keeps that log living, it keeps the plan moving, and I hope it leaves staff with tools that allow them to show the progress they're making and provide evidence and data to their bosses in the community to show like, look, we got this plan, we took that information, we're making progress with it, and here's how we're tracking it. And then the next step is, now that we have this data, we've close either we've reduced scraps, we've added X amount of bike lanes or X amount of sidewalks, but you also have, we've reduced collisions here. So there's like a lot of things that data can tell us and the plans themselves are kind of the starting point of the story. Yeah. They let you have that data. They give you almost like, where are you now? Here are things that can improve it. But a lot of times we leave it to the community because unfortunately we don't have the means to do it ourselves. Right. But it's up to them to actually make it happen. And not only do these things hold, as David said, about accountability, it makes it so that the public can hold cities and decision makers accountable to, create, to fulfilling the goals that they adopted. Right. So a lot of times you adopt a great plan or policy and it just doesn't get enough action and advocates have no tools to say like nothing happened. Right. Now they do. <laughs> and it, and it, it's something that as somebody who was a former city staffer, I know that now they have those tools, it might help make not only myself, but it helps me tell why it's an important story when we're at budgeting season, when we're doing a CIP, when we're doing these huge uh, choice points. I have yeah. data now. I have arguments that are backed by research, locally contextualized data to be like, look, there's a whole lot more we can do with this project. If we just do these recommendations, we'll get these benefits. We have data to tell us that. Yeah. And I think we used to fight that active transportation battle without it in the past. 
and it was a losing battle because everybody just said, well, I drive there. I don't need to walk there. But now we can show them, A, people are walking. B, there are short trips to get there. C, they're not going there right now because there's no sidewalk. And then D, if we do put a sidewalk, we do have this other network, we will see those trips increase. And now we have points to show us that these steps get us there. And that can really help that argument. Because a lot of times it used to be like, trust me, this bike lane will get people there. Right. When people didn't feel as safe with that data, now they can. They have something to turn to and hopefully something to continue to update and show that progress was made and that benefits have happened because of that progress. Right. I wonder too, the, uh, I'm going to pull up the uh, TriMet uh, uh, What Matters to You uh, interactive map here in just a moment. But I wanted to just mention, uh, you mentioned uh, San Luis Obispo. And of course, it's one of the cities that is striving to, to, to move forward and do some really good things. Um, but a few years ago, you know, they, they did like their first, you know, protected bikeway uh, pilot, produ- you know, I- installation. And you, you would have thought that the world was falling apart from the motoring perspective. And so I, I think it really is important important whenever possible to have a tool such as this that really helps to try to engage people, engage the populace to try to really make them part of the solution and part of the that process. Because if it's something that kind of happens to them versus they, them feeling, feeling that they are a part of the process, it, it just it, it doesn't turn out well, typically. <laughs> so talk a little bit about the power yeah. of a tool such as this. And this is, this is I think, where we want to see a lot more of our work go. Right. We have an incredible web team at Alta uh, that is capable of producing scalable web applications that the public can engage with and provide feedback on. And this is one of the, in my opinion, one of the more innovative examples of engaging people on their values in a way that's connected to data. Because a lot of times when we talk about data, when we say the words data driven, when we talk about all of that, what is often not explicitly stated is the matter of values. Because like when, when you say a metric, a metric is a measure of your progress towards a professed goal. Right. And so that connection between data and values is something that's very important to address and connect explicitly and giving the community a way to weigh in say well what are your values what are the things that we want to accomplish um, in your community uh, is it equity that's important is it safety is it is it you want to optimize based off demand help us understand where where you're key goals are and, and and then we can help you figure out how we get there. And so what's very cool about that application and similar ones, is being able to see that connection in real time, adjust that slider and hit submit. And that goes to a survey. Like that is something we could use to directly identify um, how we prioritize one improvement versus another. Right. It doesn't always have to be map based. Um, but it, it, being able to get that feedback on what those values should be and have that directly influence how recommendations are selected is a very powerful way to get buy-in for change. And I think that's, that's something we definitely want to keep exploring moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the things that you said there, uh, bring the images that you sent over for the Santa Clara, Santa Clara County, uh, VTA, uh, central bikeway. And, um, because it, it has a couple of different, uh, scenarios to it. You've got the communities of concern and you have this yeah. kind of mapped out through here. You also have, uh, the community identified yeah. destinations exactly. as well as employment areas that, you know, are throughout this little corridor of this central bikeway. And again, what we're talking about here is, is an activity asset, a, 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 an empowerment, you know, piece of facility of infrastructure, a central bikeway that, you know, you're able to like overlay all of these different, um, the different, you know, 
metrics is what you, you called it. You know, the general population is just it, that that's just like data, <laughs> you know, the, a, a word that is what metric, what's a metric is that no, what mean, what's meaningful to you. Correct. And so, you know, when you phrase it as identified, you know, destinations or desired destinations and, you know, and you're able to then, um, kind of clearly identify the value of a, uh, you know, a, a, again, a, an activity asset such as this uh, central bikeway, the empowerment, the the potential that it has, I think is very, very helpful and very powerful. I completely agree. Um, this is a part of a uh, bike highway project um, being led by a lot of our talented planners uh, that are increasingly looking at this as a kind of a very innovative um, bike facility type and in, in, in design uh, practice where we try to facilitate longer trips in a safe way um, in Santa Clara County, where we're able to take people's feedback on what's important to them, um, what destinations they want to access, and tell them explicitly how that gain in access changes from a low stress connectivity perspective. So this, what's very cool about these analyses is that this is taking into account changes in network quality right. um, that occur across the network. If we build these very comfortable, high quality bike um, highway facilities within in VTAs, um, in, in, in v, it, sorry, in Santa Clara County um, with these different alignments, what are the distributions and changes of benefits and specifically, also the ability to talk about who benefits is something that this type of approach gives us as well, um, where increasingly it's not just that top line number, understanding the equity implications of investments explicitly is, is something that can enable um, a more informed choice and, and, and make the trade-offs between which communities you serve way more explicit in, in a way that I think has been traditionally been lacking um, when we talk about transportation equity. And there's a lot of movement around uh, how do we plan based on accessibility. Organizations like Transportation for America, um, for example, are increasingly talking about it. Uh, there are different guides, um, even some that Ulta has contributed to, such as FHWA's uh, guide on multimodal connectivity. Um, increasingly looking at how do we take into account this question of what, what are the connectivity benefits of different improvements? How do we test them? Uh, and we do this using Python and other programming languages to algorithmically basically test each network, um, but then illustrate those benefits as a result of that, but then also directly communicate who those benefits go to. Right. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, we have uh, been going for almost an hour already. <laughs> what final thoughts would each of you uh, like to leave the audience with? Samuel, we'll start with you. I, the final thought I'd like to leave the audience with is that data is powerful, but data needs to be tempered in the understanding that what is important to your decision making and how you use data to help communicate to your community members and decision makers uh, and also just to help inform the community about the context of their own situation needs to be done really well and intelligently because it can really help paint the story on why recommendations matter and why planning matters. But using data indiscriminately and without proper context is just as dangerous as having no data. So making sure that you contextualize data correctly and utilize it as one of the tools, not the only tool, but as one of the big tools in how we develop plans and planning moving forward, I think is one of my biggest takeaways. And the fact is that data can be your best friend in really trying to tell your story and really trying to make change happen and make it consistent and ongoing beyond the life of that project I'm working on for you or that plan. So I'd like to see data as like a tool, but tool used well. It's really like my last takeaway from this is that it's so powerful, but use it wisely and use it correctly. And there are people who are unbelievably good at doing that that can really help you tell your story. Right. David. I think, I think 
if, if, if I was to leave one thought, it would be that data always has been a means to an end. Um, and where it's most powerful is where it can inform our narratives. It can inform our goals and identify ways to meet them. Um, but it also enables us to think of data as a round table as well, where it can bring people together fundamentally. Different disciplines, different aspects of the community can all look at the same thing and have a grounded conversation um, in that is based in the context that everybody can try to, that is familiar with and can agree on. Um, so I, I really think it's important just to keep that in mind whenever we're talking about analytics or data science. There's there's a lot of hype out there. Um, but I think the things that make me most excited is when it can be used to bring people together. Yeah. And I would probably just add, and, and, and I'll use this as my, my final image, is uh, if you can bring data alive and really make it intriguing and interesting and engaging for the populations, you know, all the better. And, you know, the, the previous slide that we just had with, uh, you know, them being able to, to use sliders and being able to interact with it is cool. Stuff like this is super, super cool because, again, it's it's visually, it's engaging. It gets people feeling like they're involved with it. And, you know, David, you mentioned it. It's just, it, it's so much more approachable than, um, you know, our static maps and being able yeah. to, to like really, you know, understand it and play with it. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, John. Pleasure is all ours. Thank you. Thank you all so much for tuning in to this episode with David and Samuel with Alta Planning and Design. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please be sure to give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below, share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. It really helps out a lot. And uh, by the way, we picked up two new patrons this past week. Uh, thank you so much, Tom and Jennifer. I really appreciate the support. And if you too would like to help support me in my efforts, there's two things that you can do. Uh, first is yes, become a patron on the Patreon page and that's at patreon.com slash active towns. And also pop on over to the active town store uh, to pick up some fun <laughs> active towns merchandise and, and streets are for people merch. It's you know just fun, whimsical. We're just trying to get the word out there and believe it or not, every t-shirt that you purchase, every water bottle, it all helps out a great deal in, in enabling me to be able to continue getting this content out to you. So uh, again, thank you so much for tuning in and for whatever support you're able to provide. And uh, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. Cheers.